which means I've lost track of people. Yeah. We're okay. up to 49 now. 49 people. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, start uh, saying a few things in preparation to those people who are already on the call. I hope you can, you can hear me uh, and uh, that you should be able to see uh, the first page of the slideshow that I'll be showing shortly. For those of you who are perhaps less familiar with Zoom, uh, a few things. Uh, there's a sort of toolbar that has the control for your microphone and your video and various other things. Uh, it includes a button labeled participants, uh, currently showing that 55 people are already on this webinar. Uh, you'll only be seeing video of the coordinators and representatives of the GBIP Secretariat, uh, but there are nearly 50 uh, other people. Uh, online and if you click on click on that link uh, you should see the details. I suppose technically it's not 50 people because some people have two connections open. On that toolbar as well you'll see a Q&A box if you click on that uh, and D Bentley says you can't see the participants list. Is that secret? All right okay I can tell you that uh, since yesterday apparently uh, we didn't make this clear to people on the first one of these calls uh, that there are now uh, nearly 60 people uh, on the call. Uh, there are the uh, eight panelists, so-called, uh, that you can see who are members of the coordination team uh, and representatives of the GBIF Secretariat, all of whom are working from home, uh, thanks to uh, the uh, SARS-CoV virus scare in Denmark. And, oh, sorry, anyway, carrying on. Uh, there's the Q&A box anyway. Uh, you should be able to see that, I hope. Um, and uh, if you click on that, uh, it'll give you the chance to ask questions at any point. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can use the standard chat control, uh, which doesn't necessarily always appear in the same menus, I think, uh, but that allows you just to, uh, to chat as several people already are. Okay, yeah, I think I think the participants list is only viewable to the panelists. Uh, so thanks, uh, Manzo, for pointing that out. Okay, um, I'll also comment at this point that we are recording this uh, uh, this webinar so that it can be shared later, and also to help us with uh, transcribing any comments uh, if they arise. Uh, and I would encourage anyone to feel free uh, to use the the, uh, the option of raising their hand. Uh, if you can see the tool for doing that, it should be on the participant screen. Uh, otherwise, um, use the chat to, to point out uh, that you'd like to say something. And uh, Tim has pointed out that Annalyn Hadsall has her hand up. So maybe Annie can, oh yeah. Is it possible to? Open the mic for so Anna Lee. I do apologise. Are you able to do that, Annie? Anna Lee. Oh, I think she might need to unmute. Looks like maybe she just has. Uh, she's also vanished. <laughs> I think. Yeah, sorry. Oh, become a panelist in the process. Anna Lee. Uh, still needs to unmute. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just carry on anyway. Um, if Anna Lee has something, oh, Anna Lee? You're unmuted, but I can't hear anything. Uh, okay, if if you wish to make a comment uh, or use the chat, uh, please please feel free, feel free to do so. Uh, the The goal of uh, this uh, this session today is not to get into any detailed discussion about natural history collections and the catalogue 
uh, in itself. It's really to make sure that uh, we've explained the process we expect to take over the next few days in a way that will uh, hopefully simplify everybody's access uh, and to review the currently outlined scope for what we want to do. Uh, and it also will give you a chance to understand the various ways in which we hope that you'll be able to contribute to the activity. In order to steer this over the next few months, we have the coordination team uh, listed here, several of whom, uh, including, uh, let me see, uh, Barbara Tears, Deb Paul, Eliza uh, Zushan, uh, Matt Woodburn and Quentin Groom and Tim Robertson are all also on this webinar. Uh, feel free at any point uh, over the next few weeks uh, to contact any of us uh, if you have questions or suggestions about how to how to do any of this uh, better or if you wish to uh, make any contributions to what's happening. The, um, the outline for this agenda uh, is listed here uh, and uh, we'll just run through it fairly quickly, uh, giving you a, a chance at the end to, to come in with uh, comments and questions on any of these topics. What we're doing here over the next couple of months really has two purposes. We're looking to try to address the very specific question of how we can work together better on a global scale to manage information about the world's natural history collections uh, and to make it more widely useful for potential users of collections, others who are interested in collections, and to help us to manage biodiversity information more generally in a more effective and interconnected way. But uh, as well as this primary goal for the workshop, we're using this as a chance to explore how we all can work together more effectively on an international scale with less uh, travel than we often have to do. Uh, we all rely heavily uh, in uh, internationally, uh, across all spheres of research, but uh, within biodiversity informatics, we certainly rely heavily on conferences and workshops. And these have many advantages for us. They're an opportunity to focus together in an intensive way, away from uh, the day-to-day -day issues of our jobs on some shared topic or problem, and hopefully to make real progress on those. Uh, and clearly, too, uh, the fact that we have opportunities to meet face to face uh, under normal circumstances uh, is excellent for helping us to build our network and become a truly international community that uh, can share understanding of the challenges and opportunities in the things we're doing. However, uh, this is something that brings with it a number of disadvantages. Uh, we are many of us very concerned about uh, the scale of uh, carbon dioxide emissions from human activities and it seems uh, at very least uh, a very negative thing that uh, so many of our activities contribute to that through uh, through flights and, and travel costs. We're also concerned and this was something that came up particularly in some of the discussions at the GBIC 2 conference back in 2018 uh, that many of our activities are biased towards participants who have access to travel funds and have the opportunity to, uh, to travel to workshops or conferences uh, and that indeed the invitation lists for these events are often highly biased uh, and we would like to find a way to ensure that all of our uh, consultations and collaborations are as open and inclusive as possible to colleagues from all over the world. Uh, we're not going to solve all of these problems. Um, certainly there will be a continuing challenge with the fact that much of what we're doing in the next couple of months and more generally is in English, uh, but we hope to be able to experiment with ways to bring more of our colleagues from around the world into our discussions. Uh, and another disadvantage of having to travel to places for meetings is that very often 
uh, there's a need to set aside several days to participate, uh, potentially to recover from uh, international travel. And clearly, uh, as many of you are more than aware at the moment, uh, we're, we're facing a situation right now where many events around the world, uh, the RDA conference in Melbourne, for example, uh, have now been uh, cancelled, curtailed, uh, or postponed because of the concerns around viruses. So based on all of this, we believe that it's important for us to find a better alternative, not the only way that we deal with uh, solving our problems together, but to find a way that makes it open for anyone with an interest in a topic to participate, for us together to build cons consensus uh, and develop a truly international plan uh, and to use the Earth CO2 budget more wisely. The model we're taking for this um, is, uh, is, is focused on simultaneously trying to solve a few different goals. Number one, uh, we want this to be an effective consultation activity. And as a measure of that, we hope that at the end of what we're doing over the next couple of months, we will be able together to develop a co-authored white paper that really does express a common vision and a roadmap for us all to work together in how we manage information about collections, something that can identify the challenges and the opportunities uh, and help us to uh, align our efforts more fully. We want to do this in a way that avoids international and indeed national travel. We want, other than right now, it's quarter past two in the morning here in Australia, but we want to avoid late night calls as much as possible uh, and to do things in a way that is asynchronous and easy for anybody to, uh, to fit into their normal daily lives and work schedules. We want to keep the technical requirements generally as low as we can, not require high bandwidth connections, and we want to include as many people as possible in this activity. And given that this is our first attempt uh, within uh, GBIF uh, in doing something quite like this, we really do want to learn what, what works and what could be improved in the future. Uh, and we see it as one of the probable outputs of this activity for us to produce a second paper that discusses uh, the challenges and uh, any lessons learned around improving how we use web tools uh, to carry on a, a detailed discussion. In more detail, the model we're following, uh, we've already circulated what we've called the ideas paper. Uh, and I hope that most of you at least have had a chance to look at that uh, before tonight's call. Uh, this is intended to seed the whole discussion uh, by identifying the broad areas of the topic we want to explore and breaking it down into a number of subtopics that we expect each to form a thread uh, in the ongoing consultation. We've got this session and the one we had yesterday uh, as an opportunity to, uh, to clarify exactly what we're doing and um, dig into the scope a little bit. Uh, we will then move over the next month into a stage where anyone who has uh, the opportunity to provide good insights and uh, prepare some materials to uh, assist with the consultation, much as one might prepare a presentation for a conference, has the chance to do so and that we prepare those in a way that can uh, guide the, the upcoming discussion. We will upload all of these to the GBIF discourse site uh, in a way that I'm just about to describe uh, and we'll open that site no later than the 6th of April. Uh, if we can get the materials together sooner, uh, we would expect to open it before then to give everyone a chance to review uh, the prepared materials and to start considering how to contribute to all of the different topic threads. And then over the period from the 17th to the 29th of April, uh, we plan to have a rolling discussion in the discourse threads. Uh, discourse is just a, a forum site uh, for those of you who haven't used it before. Uh, and uh, although, uh, although some of the 
some of the features of first getting getting in and starting to use it may be very slightly different from other sites that you've used. Uh, in general, I think uh, there's very little that will be surprising to anybody who's ever been involved in a web discussion. The coordinators plan to uh, monitor those discussions, make sure that uh, we're staying on track and uh, dealing with all the topics and emailing regular summaries. Uh, we're planning on these daily, at least on, on weekdays, to uh, help all of the participants to know where the discussion has reached, uh, which questions remain open, and potentially new topics and ideas that may need uh, more exploration. Uh, the aim of that is to make sure that anybody who wants to be part of the discussion can be kept up to date on all of the uh, the new topics and items added without having to dig through the whole thing. Uh, our aim is for anyone to be able to spend perhaps half an hour a day catching up and being able just to comment on the things that they think are, are areas where they can add some value. And out of that at the end, uh, we want to deliver a white paper that will be a, uh, a guide for us all in looking at uh, next steps around building databases uh, and a global view of the uh, of information about the world's collections. We've thought through the structure for the site on discourse that we would set up and the aim here is to make sure that there are threads for every single one of those topics in the ideas paper and any others that we identify as important, that there are pages for discussion of any of the supplied materials. Uh, and um, I'm going to give Valter a, a chance to comment in just a second. Um, and, uh, and as we go forward, the coordinators regular summaries uh, of everything that's going on. And by keeping all of these anchored in a welcome and orientation page, we do want it to be easy to catch up quickly uh, and rejoin the discussion if people have been away for a few days. Vauta, uh, can we give Vauta Adink the chance to speak? Yeah, sorry uh, for interrupting. Uh, no trouble. I have a question about the, the white paper, the, the shared vision. Uh, uh, shared yeah. vision, what? But uh, basically, you answered that question already. Okay. Uh, All right. But, uh, I Thank think, you. I think it's, uh, we should be very clear on, on um, a shared version of, of what we, we want to um, achieve. Yeah. Uh, I have another question as well. Um, so, this consultation, who is included in this consultation? Is that also. Um, stakeholders from outside the biodiversity community? Is that also uh, infrastructures like uh, LifeWords or, or technical infrastructures like EGI or? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the interest here is in bringing into this discussion anyone uh, and any projects and any organizations that have some interest in the information about collections. Uh, understanding the user needs, understanding the opportunities for others to uh, build on or uh, exploit information about collections is really critical. So all of those that you've just described, um, I hope that many of them will um, already have been uh, made aware of what's going on through the early communications. But uh, at the end of this, I'm gonna be asking all of you to help us to get the message out more widely. I also think it's important for us to be thinking about how we can, at very least, bridge the gap between biodiversity collections and uh, the, the needs of geological collections and potentially more widely scientific collections, uh, and also the bridge between what happens in collections of preserved materials and the activities of living collections, uh, including botanic gardens, culture collections, uh, and potentially zoos and aquaria. Uh, we discussed this a little bit yesterday uh, and recognized that the, the needs and the use cases, especially for some of those living collections, are, uh, are often 
very diverse uh, and different from those for a natural history collection. But we're interested in knowing whether there are aspects that can be shared. Uh, and I do recognize that uh, for many of those who are uh, looking after natural history collections, they're, also, they're, they're looking after, as part of that, uh, geological collections, uh, including fossils, but also including minerals. Uh, and there's interest in how we uh, ensure that the universe of their needs is also uh, addressed uh, if that's appropriate. Uh, so Alison uh, has, has also asked about archeological and anthropological collections. Um, I think this is an excellent question. And I know that uh, the collections descriptions uh, group of Tadwick has spent quite a bit of time in looking at the broader context of, uh, of collections. I think we, we do need to avoid getting ourselves into such a wide scope that we are unable to deliver something useful, but I don't know whether either Deb or Matt would like to say something at that point. Um, either one of us, I'd be happy to say, Matt, would you, yeah. you jump in to add anything? I would like to say what we have decided as best practice, getting advice from the community is that for the first version of the standard, uh, we'll focus on museum collections uh, in this, I guess, in a more restricted sense. And then, but we were advised to create several use cases, for example, like a soil uh, sample use case, where we would use it to test the model to make sure that in the future, if the model was to be expanded to accept those kinds of collection descriptions, it wouldn't break. And another example would be to follow up on Allison's question here, would be, um, we do have a group from the Field Museum. I do not know if they're with us today until I scan the list. Um, they have gone ahead and branched out to try to address the ability to add zooarchaeological information in the model that we're actually starting with to see if it'll fit. And I want to make it clear to people at this point, we are calling it the collection description standard for this point. It is not called the natural collection description standard anymore. And that is because we wanted to make it possible in the future to add more collection types. Matt, did you want to add yeah. anything to that? Yeah, I think that's a fair representation. Um, I think one of the points is that we are trying to uh, progress as quickly as possible towards the first draft of the standard um, in September and that means that we need to constrain the scope to a certain degree but um, what we're not doing is discouraging anybody that wants to put some time into working up those use cases that aren't within say, the first draft scope um, to put some effort into the thoughts around that how it fits into the standard so that when we move on to kind of future extensions definitely um, and uh, uh, you know, continued development of the standard after the first version, that it would be easy to incorporate those as well. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, and there's a comment also from Kate Webbing here, just saying that trying not to ex exclude, I assume, anthropological data. Um, I, the, 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 the one comment I would make uh, on, on t in regard to this is that, Clearly, the more our solutions and the more our vision encompasses and supports the needs of a wider community of collections, the more value it may be able to bring, at least in, in some contexts. On the other hand, uh, as, with, um, as with a lot of other aspects of biodiversity informatics, I think when we deal with the biodiversity and natural history side of things, we very often have much tighter and more e obviously uh, defined use cases for what we want to do. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we need to make sure that we do solidly address the needs of natural history collections and biodiversity informatics um, and not uh, end up with uh, thinking so widely and in such generic terms that uh, that we're not delivering the concrete things that I think the ideas paper has has tried to to address. 
for example, some of the issues around loans from natural history collections, some of the underpinnings that may be needed for uh, GBIF and other um, data aggregating activities such as iDigBio and ALA to make good use of specimen data, uh, the linkages between uh, specimens and, uh, the, and the taxonomic literature, all of these are ones that uh, may not exactly carry over in exactly the same way into some of these other categories of collection. So um, I'd like us to keep an, our, our eyes on the broader universe of collections, but not to go uh, too, far, um, too, too far away from the core or, or for ensuring that we meet our core goals around natural history. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll just carry on because I, um, I'll come back to the, the main section for, uh, I think for open discussion fairly soon. We've, um, this, this I suppose was, uh, has, has already been fairly extensively discussed um, that we, we have a, a certain focus on what uh, has been crudely perhaps called natural history collections, uh, a focus that is reflected uh, in the activities of many of those who are involved uh, in the consultation team. Uh, and, um, and we know that uh, several of these activities are working very effectively indeed with particular communities, either at a national or regional scale, uh, as is the case with CTAF and with the ALA, or with particular types of collections, most notably Index Herbariorum with the Herbaria, uh, but others also like the World Directory of Culture Collections. Uh, and al alongside this, we have areas such as botanic gardens that certainly have some overlap uh, and uh, could be part of what we're discussing. And as well, we have uh, perhaps much thinner in some ways, but uh, with a broader scope, the work that's gone into the Global Registry of Scientific Collections, uh, which has been uh, taken up for hosting uh, on the GBIF infrastructure, uh, and which uh, can uh, be part of what we what we all need to deliver and indeed provides a framework uh, into which a lot of the other information could be connected. So what we want to do is think about the interests and needs of all of these different communities, uh, both at the, the comprehensive global scale, but also uh, nationally and regionally and in different thematic areas and to make sure that we reinforce together the things that are working well, uh, learn lessons from them, uh, but also uh, bring it all together in ways that minimize uh, duplication and, uh, and wasted effort. Uh, okay, I'll, I, I suggest, uh, Dipankar, that I just, just go through the next four slides and then I think we'll be at precisely the point that uh, many people would like to be. And I'm really encouraged to see so much interaction uh, on this webinar tonight. The ideas paper has been circulated uh, and it, it broadly divides up our topic into four big areas. The uses for, the ca for a catalog of the world's natural history collections, the kind of information we would like to see in it, the technological solutions and uh, software components, etc., and standards that we have that can help us to build it and how we govern this, uh, this shared activity in a way that is uh, favorable and supports the needs of all of the key stakeholders. And in order to do that, um, as in the, uh, the right-hand side of this slide, we've structured everything around a short description of a, a topic area and a set of questions that can then be the basis for ongoing discussion. Uh, and the discourse forum will be primarily be structured around these topics with their questions uh, we will focus in the email updates on making sure that we navigate towards some kind of either consensus or clarification of the issues for each of these topics uh, and at the end of the day aim to uh, get that consensus or document the alternatives. 
very quickly because I don't want to go into too much detail on things that don't need to be discussed at this point. The uses for the catalogue section looks at the various ways in which the information can be used more widely. It certainly, uh, as with Index Herbariorum, it may provide a directory to support the collections communities. Uh, understanding where collections are and what they contain is important for locating specimens. It's also potentially a first step towards databasing them. Uh, there's the possibility, which I know has been important for some collections, particularly larger and older collections, of being able to understand their scale and their value. Uh, there are linkages we can form with other types of data, such as specimens and taxonomic publications, and therefore increase the, uh, the connectedness and the value of some of those data. And at the moment, uh, we have a lot of um, duplicated and potentially out of date information in some areas uh, and it would be better if we could find ways to avoid that and to avoid duplication of effort and most interestingly of all uh, i think as um, as indicated by um, by the uh, some of the plans for example within the disco project in europe uh, having an understanding of the collections as an infrastructure gives us a chance to think about them uh, about a catalog as a foundation for new and enriched services and there's lots of possible things we could be doing if we had this information. Deb and Matt are heavily involved as are several other people um, on this call in the work of um, it still says natural collections here the the collection descriptions group and the standard that has been developed in the past uh, and that they are now revising. So we want to, to think about how the work of the Tadwigs community and uh, any other work around standards can support uh, the, the construction of a catalogue. We don't need to define everything, but we do need to know what, uh, what items of information are important and to make sure that we are communicating clearly with the collection descriptions group on uh, potential um, improvements or enhancements or additions that may be valuable. And we're looking also to think about how information in the catalog can underpin wider data linkages and information services. Several catalogs already exist and we don't want just to tear them apart in any way, we want to reinforce those. Uh, and each of those may serve as a useful pathway for managing, publishing and updating data. That includes the existing community catalogues, by which I mean things like Index Herbariorum or iDigBio. Uh, it includes also the need for us to think about how we want to use uh, something like GR Cycle, uh, the Global Registry of Scientific Collections. And I'm interested in the ways in which other software, such as, for example, collection management systems, can underpin what we're doing. And none of this. Uh, can happen purely as a technical activity. We need to do this in a way that supports collections, reinforces their profile and their branding, uh, and that gives real credit and value back to the people who put the work into maintaining the collections and in maintaining collection information. And so we've got to think about all of the governance aspects, including incentives for contributors and funding. So. I'd like to, to break here, and I see that uh, there have been several comments coming in through the, uh, through the chat, uh, but what, are the, what suggestions do you have about ways to improve either the process or the, uh, the scope of the things that we're proposing to discuss? In particular, should we be adding any extra topics and I would comment that one of the things that did come out of the discussions yesterday was that uh, there was there should be more explicit focus and potentially even separate topics on the place of regional activities uh, in all of this uh, that different regions different countries may have different opportunities either to uh, to publish and share information about their collections or 
have different effective ways to get that information out to people who may be interested users. Uh, and rather than simply focusing on a one size solution fitting all, uh, we should think about how much we want to break out into some uh, regional subtopics. Uh, I'll, I'll just pick up immediately on a couple of the topics. Uh, we, living collections uh, has been something that um, I've tried to comment on in passing. I'm, I'm certainly very interested in how we can uh, do a better job of uh, supporting living collections. Some of the use cases that may be appropriate for uh, a collections catalog or, or, um, may not apply in their cases, potentially, for example, around uh, loans of specimens and uh, some of the other uses of specimens. But uh, there are definitely overlaps in terms of scope and coverage and the kind of information that could be shared about them. So um, it would be good to get perspectives from those on this call, uh, either tonight or in the, the weeks to come, about ways that we can effectively uh, bring in the interests of living collections, including bringing in people who are working with living collections into this. Uh, I would say that a wood collection is very much a biodiversity collection, but I do realize that uh, in some institutions they're handled rather differently. Uh, bu 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 bu. So, um, you want to say anything, Valta, about your comment there on your presentation? Is Walter able to unmute himself, Annie? He's got his hand up, but he's on mute. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I was I was muted. Um, yes, sir, Donald. Um, actually, I would I would like to make a comment that um, I think I saw a nice um, a summary from Cal um, about the things that we need to describe in the paper. That's the information model, the technical model, and the governance model. And for the technical model, he lists identification, description, linkages, and services. Now, linkages could be your service also, but I think especially the first one, identification of collections, needs to uh, to have um, um, be discussed as, as an, a separate topic. I think. Yeah. Um, that not not, okay. uh, not clear enough topic in the in the in the IDS paper. And when you say um, identification, you mean what is a collection and, and giving them IDs to separate them and things like that? Identification, so giving them ideas, IDs. Yeah, yeah, and okay. To, and see how to do that in a global domain yep. uh, of collections. Um, and, and the link that I put in the chat is um, about a presentation that I uh, held in, uh, in the Mobilize uh, workshop a few weeks ago and in that presentation i had included a slide with some recommendations um, mm -hmm. for changes in the uh, dio cycle and it lists a few things that are not or not clearly included yet in um, in the in the topics uh, document um, like um, provenance information uh, mm -hmm. machine readability um, tagging of collections so that's uh, for separate use cases. You can have collections of, of collections, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it should be services to link to um, all the references of, of collections. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll certainly take a take a good look at that presentation over the, the next few days. I think some of the things that you've said, uh, um, at least they're intended to be in the document, but you may very well be right that they're not properly uh, and clearly enough presented and opened up as topics. So um, I'll follow up with you uh, offline afterwards just to make sure that we do accommodate some of those points and thoughts, Vouter. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, so David, coordination with journals and their editorial teams. Yeah, um, 
you're definitely right on that as as one of the topics. Do you want to say anything specific? David Shorthouse. Ah, good. You can hear me then. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. So um, lately, Rod and I have been playing with trying to extract specimen codes from the primary literature, as many of us have attempted to do in the past. And I don't think it would be in our best interest to um, lose sight of where collections are being cited uh, in the primary mm -hmm. literature. So, you know, I just uh, in the same manner that ORCID and um, research, what are they called? ROAR, whatever, <laughs> whatever that acronym stands for, the Research Organization Registry Community, mm -hmm. um, have made some very functional relationships with uh, journals um, and publishing houses. I think um, there ought to be coordination done um, with, with those major groups as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. That's uh, it. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll go back because um, I know that uh, Dip, uh, Dipankar uh, wanted to, I think, said he'd like to make a comment. Is that correct? Hello. 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 I can hear you. Uh, Donald, you are hearing me? Yes. So I'm asking that uh, I'm from India, mm -hmm. and uh, is there any problem in hearing me? Uh, there's there's some exciting echo, but um, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a bit. Just uh, Donald, what I'd like to mention here, <laughs> that is uh, I'm from India and. Uh, it is our group is working very closely in a very small initiative that we have taken so far to develop a biodiversity informatics group in Indian subcontinent and with special reference to South Asian countries. But biodiversity informatics pertains to the collections and developing a repository of natural history collections, both living and non-living that you have amply told and very clearly and the technicalities, its governance, it is really it is in its nations in Indian subcontinent. Obviously, this OA veneer is very important for our very small group that we are planning to go ahead to develop a South Asian platform here with the technical knowledge and all those support from the synthesis and the GBIF, whatever will be feasible and possible the way you are thinking of to develop a regional uh, hub of all this uh, global network that you are planning for. And ultimately everything will lead to synthesizing all those tacit and dynamic informations for mm -hmm. the better understanding uh, the millions and even the billions of informations uh, how they will be synthesized properly to derive into a conclusions. And all those informations will give a tangible benefit in understanding uh, the kind of data that we do have and the kind of platform where all those data will be orchestrated or it will be mm -hmm. functionally yeah. implicable or applicable in a better understanding to develop a plan. Maybe it is a kind of a basic understanding to its applied aspects. So I need your uh, wisdom and knowledge in this. And this is very, very humble submissions uh, to increase my knowledge. You can say that, Donald. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and it's, it's a real pleasure to have you, uh, have you involved in this process and to work with you on this. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, certainly, um, we'll, we'll, I'll certainly follow up um, after this um, and uh, try and understand a bit more about what you're doing. Uh, but I certainly do hope that uh, what we're doing over the next month will be of real value and an assistance uh, and that we'll be able to gain your involvement uh, in what we're trying to put together together.
thank you thank you so much donald thank you so much thank you and all the and all the esteemed panelists in this webinar and i'm very much here listening to all of your words and uh, it is helping me immensely i can say this well thank you very much that's really good to know okay uh thank uh sorry uh, Alison, what about maybe crafting more uniform way for generating, digitizing physical collections, objects? Uh, did you want to make any further comment on that? If so, raise your hand. Um, I'm scrolling through the, the, the messages quite slowly. Uh, what, what I suggest, um, what I suggest is, okay, Alison, if uh, you got your hand up now, the rest of you who put comments, uh, if you uh, would like to speak, uh, raise your hands, then we can keep track on you. And I'll try and read the, through these as we're going. Uh, Uh, okay, Alison, Alison. Your microphone is unmuted. You should be able to speak. So Alison says she hasn't on the chat. She says she hasn't got a microphone. So. Ah, oh, okay. So unmuted, but. Uh... Okay. Uh, so thanks. Th thanks for your comments, Alison. I'll try and catch up with those as I scroll through this. Uh, and uh, if if you feel at the end of this that there are things that you still want to communicate, please do uh, email them and we'll try and um, share them more widely afterwards. Uh, do, do, somebody else. Uh, Valter, your hand's back up. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, All right. I have, uh, I have a suggestion though, but I put it in the chat already for improving the process. Uh, that is that uh, there is an interest group in uh, RDA on physical samples uh, that may, may be helpful for um, for uh, ensuring interoperability with other domains. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thierry asks if personal collections would be in scope. Um, yes, they are. And I think, okay, and I think perhaps we should be more explicit uh, about exploring the challenges of what that means. Uh, the One of the early topics in the, um, in the ideas paper, uh, I thought maybe, uh, probably the, the um, definition of a natural history collection was meant to uh, be an area at which we could uh, dig into some of these aspects. Uh, that's topic 2.1, uh, which involves agreeing what counts as a natural history collection in our context and what should be uh, excluded. Uh, we should, if, oh, it does mention personal collections and it mentions Xyleria, wood collections and things there as well. Uh, so there's a whole load of issues we have here around the, the edges of the set of things that we feel we need to uh, to identify and describe, and this the, it also touches there on the topic of um, I think what uh, Bouter called tagging collections, collections within collections, effectively uh, the possibly hierarchical scope of them. Although for some reason the word taxonomics crept in, which maybe uh, was confusing. Anybody else wish to raise a hand at this point? Uh, okay, I'll, Elspeth has just raised a question about Wikidata and has it been covered to death yet? Uh, yesterday's call, we did talk at quite some length uh, about Wikipedia and Wikidata. Uh, we, we had a discussion about how we could make sure that good information about collections entered Wikipedia. Uh, and some of the responses on that were that it can be challenging to do it because it can be seen by uh, the editors of Wikipedia as advertising for institutions and therefore it often gets deleted. But I do think that by thinking about the kind of content we'd like to see in Wikidata, uh, often very factual information about collections, 
uh, perhaps we should then be exploring how we could be uh, encouraging the inclusion of some of that standardized information uh, in boxes uh, on Wikipedia pages. I would comment though something that, that came up after the, the call yesterday that uh, I'm very interested in whether there are other regional information portals, uh, particularly in countries that may not have such high levels of Wikipedia or Wiki, I suppose, Wikimedia, Wiki, Wikidata activity generally, uh, whether there are other uh, national, regional portals that might be important ones for us to be thinking about uh, in those areas as possible channels for data. Did you want to say anything else, Quentin? No, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, I assume, uh, how did it do? Nobody else has there raised a uh, hand. unanswered question been asked twice, Donald. Uh, ethno okay. botanical collections, are they in scope? There's, there's many right. questions about the scope here, which we're gonna have to clarify uh, yeah. as we get into the, the conference. Yeah. Um, I guess ethnobotanical collections are things um, of effectively uh, dual use collections. Um, and from one standpoint, they may very naturally fit into exactly the same space as a natural history collection. But um, yeah, it's, it's one of these edge cases. Uh, well, from our side, it's edge cases. From the standpoint of ethnobotanists, it's the core case, I guess. Um, and we, we are going to need to explore this during as part of the definition uh, question. Uh, okay, and David's brought back the question of provenance of collections. So the histories, the splits, the redistributions. Um, so I'm just reading Alison's last writing today. I'm not sure I fully understood Alison's last one oh, there. Can, can I jump in for a second? Oh, please do. Okay, so this yes. is Deb from IDIG Bio, for those of you who don't know who I am, and it's a digitization effort in the US, and I'm part of this standards development process, and I wanted to clarify a couple things I see going on here. So to Alison and everyone, we there's separate processes going on here. So one is a background process to develop the data standard. So for those of you who are familiar with things like Darwin Core or ABCD, so to come up with a standard set of terms and what goes in those buckets, if you will, elements like in a database where you're gonna fill out a form. And the level that we're talking about here is the higher level, what do you have as an entity, as an entire collection, not the specific record about a specific item. And when you asked the question, Allison, earlier, I wasn't sure if you were talking about the level of a, an individual record about a specimen or whether you're talking about the broader knowledge about what an entire museum holds for given collections. So, and then the point you just raised is it's very difficult to do this connecting back. This is a huge challenge we know we have in the broader community about aggregators develop information and, and, and tell us things about our data and then they provide information back to the data provider who has a difficult time um, taking that information back. And that is certainly something we, we know. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was um, the scope issue, just to be very, very clear, the difference between what Donald is talking about with regard to what uh, we want in a world collection catalog in the future and this open discussion about what the scope should be and the initial scope of the collection description data standard, what it, what it should do first and what it should support so that we can make sure we get it to work for that set of items and then expand it. So build it in such a way that it's expandable. So just wanted, there's a sort of like separate pieces. I hope that's clearer, but if not, more questions, please. I've, I've just cut and pasted uh, a block of text from the ideas paper 
that uh, I hope helps to, oh, it doesn't necessarily answer the questions that people are asking, but uh, we said there, um, among other things, uh, practices vary across the community within Index Herbariorum, Herbarium Records, no, they're not that. Um, Within zoology, museums are often structured as a set of collections with differing and possibly hierarchical taxonomic scope. And I think uh, it's been pointed out that there are other ways in which collections may nest inside each other and may have histories that have to be taken into consideration, the provenance issues. Specimens collected on famous expositions or by significant researchers may have their own identity. Other categories that may require consideration include living collections, microbial collections, zoos, aquaria, botanic gardens, seed banks, Specially managed collections, e.g. tissue collections, DNA repositories, slide banks, xylaria or wood collections, and university and personal collections. So uh, our point there is not that all of these things are in or all of these things are out, but that uh, we need to think about how they relate to everything else that uh, we're going to discuss. Uh, for some, some parts of the uh, the, the ideas paper, the, uh, the focus is perhaps narrower than uh, this, this very broad range of different types of collection. The, um, it may be focused much more narrowly on things that uh, are um, explicitly specimens of, um, of organisms that are identified uh, to a particular species or, or taxonomic group. But there are other things here which may be broader. And together, we've got to work out how all of this uh, fits into the space of trying to produce some useful tools and useful information. Uh, OK. Arnold, can I jump in? Please do. Make a comment. Um, some people are asking questions only to panelists. Um, so if you could, when ah. questions, please make sure that it goes to panelists and attendees. We can all see right. what's being asked. Um, yeah. We have Vincent, who's had his hand up for quite a while. Um, okay, if, yes. If you could unmute yourself, please. And then we have Anna Lee again. Okay. Vince. Hi, everybody. Um, just a very quick comment from me, but it sort of relates a little bit to this issue of scope. So firstly, I guess I'm really heartened by the level of interest in this topic because I, and I think many others, see it as really foundational to being able to deliver a whole set of much richer services in the future. So that's great. Um, I think there are many potential use cases, though, some thematic, some regional, some project-based, for example. And I guess there's a slight risk that if we are, um, if we sort of try to solve all of these problems in one go, um, we're going to maybe not be able to solve the core challenge, which is this issue of, at least in the first case, getting that high level metadata on collections together. So maybe a more modular approach whereby we, we focus on the core, but we have these sort of, I see yeah. a bit like sort of Darwin core extensions, really. You have these thematic groups that might be able to discuss and consider some of these other, maybe slightly more niche or regional needs, mm -hmm. but at the same time focusing on that core. Perhaps that might be um, uh, a way to tackle that challenge. Yeah, I, I think that's really useful. And uh, possibly one of the things we need to be thinking about in the the next couple of weeks is whether to split some of these things out up front as separate topics that can support that kind of sub-community discussion or whether we want to let those evolve according to interest uh, when we get a little bit further. Uh, da -da. Okay. Uh, thanks, Vince. Uh, Annalie. Remember, she doesn't have a mic, I think. She's okay. going to type in the chat her question, I think, if she All right. put it in there. Okay. Mark has raised on chat a couple of times um, today um, that people don't really know outside of our community about the collections. And he suggests that um, the communication of... Sorry, my thing just jumped. Um, one where previous projects have stumbled, it's been because of low visibility or uptake. And I think this is an important point. 
Mark, is there something that you want to elaborate on this call or are you just raising this as something you'd like to see us focus on in the, the actual uh, workshop? He's still on mute. Uh, Mark, you're on mute. Are you able? Do you have a microphone? You can. Uh, oh, we. Oh, sorry. Do we need to unmute? He says he has no uh, microphone. Okay. All right. Uh, there was something there. I just. Yeah. There's th there's several comments here about uh, the global south, about um, communication of the outcomes. Uh, I, I recognize that uh, with even the, the, the best ambitions we have, uh, we are not going to connect with all of the communities, especially uh, those outside uh, Europe and North America with whom we really want to be connecting and whom we want to involve at all stages. Uh, in this discussion. So uh, we are very interested uh, from anybody who's on this call or anybody else who gets involved in this process to find good ways to communicate at all stages, both to communicate that we're having this discussion and as we uh, proceed and hopefully get to the stage of having a, a white paper with some thoughts and ideas and next steps, uh, how we communicate that more widely and associated with that, how we communicate the, uh, the possible tools and uh, projects and networks uh, that uh, different collections and different collection users can get involved in. Yeah, okay, so Andy, um, you're quite right. Uh, it's interesting, yesterday it was such a quiet call that we happily dealt with all three questions very easily. Here there is such a flood of discussion which is really heartening, uh, but we're not really keeping up with, with the flow. Uh, as, as I hope is clear, uh, we're not expecting to be using this mechanism for the main consultation uh, in April. Uh, if there's this level of uh, discussion on every thread, then uh, the other coordinators and I will certainly have plenty of work to do to try and keep everything summarized and on track and to uh, revisit uh, questions and uh, ideas that people are raising. Uh, but I'm looking forward to that being uh, the challenge at that point. Uh, okay. Um, I think we've probably touched on many of the issues around scope. Pointing people at the QA rather than chat may help. It might do, but we had, okay. Uh, I'm not sure that, yeah. If, if people wish to raise questions, they can try doing it through the Q&A box in, in the toolbar. Uh, in mine, it's next to the little participants button. Um, if you do that, then you can ask a question which will appear in a different window. Uh, and might uh, more easily break out from the big long thread. We will, um, we will review all of this discussion after the, the webinar and make sure that if there are things that uh, we haven't touched on that seem to be unclear, we'll come back to them. Um, it, Deb, you want to draw attention to something? Uh, one, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out how to use the question and answer box myself. So I asked Erica if she would jump in so we could all see a question pop up in there. So I, right. please. If, if for uh, people who've got it open already. Just learning how to use it. And I noticed down in the bottom, at least for us, the Q&A box has a little one pop up as we learn how to use Zoom right. to, to do this. Right. So navigating back to some of the things Andy brought up, I just was wondering how much other people had similar questions. 
there's this notion to just relieve everyone's ideas about this hierarchical question, what to do about the fact that collections have sub-collections and they describe themselves in, in very different ways. And in the collection, in developing the model to try to deal with this, I can say one thing I find interesting is in 2000, 2002, somewhere in there, the, natu the, uh, the library community, special collections, they tried to do exactly what we're describing here. And they found it, they got as far as the meta level. We have a museum, we have a building, it has books in it, and here's how many books we have, and here's who to contact. So that sort of level of information they found navigable. They could understand it, and they could describe it. But when they got to the sub-collections part, they ran into, it basically says in their paper, this is too hard, we can't do it. So that now we're fast forward 20 years later, and I, I want everyone to be really aware that Matt uh, Woodburn here on this call and others in this group are acutely aware of the challenges of doing that, but also how far we've come. And that there are the model being described that we're planning right now would support the ability to do either one, to be able to say, here's a collection in its entirety, or here's a collection described by parts. And those parts might be taxonomic parts, they might be geographic parts, they might be um, described by storage type, uh, they might be, you know, these are all our collections from the Southern Hemisphere. So we, we are aware of the need for hierarchical understanding. Okay, I hope that helps. Thanks. Actually, if I could just add to that, um, I think it's, it, it's what's come out. It's one of the things that's come out of the Tadwick group is that there is a need to think about collections as being very dynamic, um, very contextual things and concepts. So when you're talking about sub collections, a collection could be a sub collection of, say, it's a Darwin fossils collection. It could be a sub collection of Darwin collections and or fossil collections at the same time. So we're looking at something which is a bit more of a rich kind of graph-like relationship than a single um, uh, constant rigid hierarchy and that's one of the issues that we're trying to get around but I think now we're 20 years on from the library example we have some more data modeling concepts that we can draw upon to try and address that. Right, right and, and, and presumably we need a solution that allows us to fragment the representation of a collection according to the ability of that collection to do so. So a collection that is only ready to present itself as one big building full of stuff can do so. And those who have, have, have a desire and a need to be able to refer and identify subsets, even overlapping subsets, potentially have mechanisms to do so. So the flexibility, I think, is part of this. So Christian, um, has he sent it to everybody um, has made the point that uh, he's not completely clear on which cons cons contributions are sought before discussion uh, and which are meant to start after April and uh, in some ways I think we've we've plunged you know, quite naturally because it's where the real interest is plunged into talking about some of the realities of what we want to do with collections which is good but uh, the main focus um, of for that discussion should be uh, next month uh, not to not, not to put you off too much. So what I've done is I've, I've, I've just switched to the next slide where I was going to try and deal with this question a little bit more of, of uh, how to contribute to this process. Uh, and it's, uh, it doesn't fully answer Christian's question, but I'll, I'll try to make sure that I do that. Over the next, um, the next few weeks up to the 6th of April, we really would like any of you or any others that uh, that you can nudge who have been involved in doing something interesting around uh, modeling data for natural history collections or managing a portal for information about natural history collections uh, to uh, to approach the uh, the, the coordinators, the panel members you, you see here, myself or one of the others, uh, with an offer to provide some material that feeds into the discussion. Think about that as something that responds to one or more of the topics in the ideas paper, or if it's really 
a completely novel topic uh, identifies that and, uh, and offers it. We're looking for materials that can help those who participate in the main consultation to understand what's already happening, what ideas are already in place, what tools already exist, and to be able to take them into account as we go into the discussion. So if you have something like that, prepare a short document, a slide set that's self-explanatory, a video, a podcast, um, whatever is most appropriate so that we can put it up on the discourse site with everything else. That's one of the things that we would like people to be doing uh, in the next few weeks. And we will uh, approach uh, some of the people who are involved in uh, known activities to encourage them to do this. And several people here, the things that they've already been pointing to uh, would be excellent examples of this. Uh, in doing so, we want these things to be short so that they don't take a lot of time for somebody to consume uh, and uh, as far as possible, not to assume any prior knowledge, but feel free to point off to richer information somewhere else. A second thing that we're looking for now is offers of assistance uh, with translation of some of the materials. Uh, there are two ways that this could be useful, one of which is around um, providing uh, translations or short summaries of some of the materials that we'll be uploading to Discourse, but we realize that that could be a very big burden. But if you believe that it will be of real assistance to, uh, to colleagues uh, speaking languages other than English uh, to get some of these things translated, then and you're prepared and have the time to help with some of that, please let us know. Perhaps even more uh, usefully, we're hoping that when we enter the consultation, uh, we will be able to uh, translate some of the information in the summary emails that we'll be trying to send out each day into other key languages uh, that, uh, that may assist uh, speakers of those languages to follow and interact more effectively with the consultation. And uh, it doesn't say this on this slide, but uh, I would also be very interested in anyone who would be interested in helping to curate a, uh, a thread for speakers of another language other than English uh, so that they can make contributions in their own language uh, and where whoever's helping to oversee that thread will make sure that any points that need uh, interaction with the rest of the consultation can be transferred into the the relevant English language discussions, just so that we keep everything connected. If you're interested in doing any of that, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, and as I mentioned already, uh, we would like to make sure that any, uh, particularly those who may not be part of uh, the, uh, the main networks that GBIF and some of the other organizations here are connecting with, that they're made aware of the consultation uh, and uh, directed to us if they have questions about how to get involved. Uh, we really want to involve as many interested people as possible. So these are the focus activities for uh, the next month or so. And if I go back to, to this view here, uh, the idea is that we will then uh, get to the point of opening the discourse site with all of these materials early in April. Uh, it's quite possible that if a few things are coming in late, we may add them after that date. But uh, that would be a time particularly to give people a chance to review all of these materials in preparation for the discussions. Um, aside from that, we're not, uh, we're not specially looking to uh, try and dig too deeply into any of the, uh, the topics uh, before we, we start uh, for real. If you, if you wish to communicate with us, please do feel free to do so though, because uh, you may well have points that uh, we've failed to address properly uh, in the ideas paper, uh, and that there's a risk that we might not address in the main consultation. Um, okay, uh, do any other hands up at the moment? No other hands up. Um, so I'll, I'll take it to this point. Um, 
uh, you've, uh, it's, it's, it's an hour and a quarter into this, uh, so I, I really appreciate all of the discussion. Are there any points that people wish to make uh, now uh, or suggestions before we close the webinar? Uh, like I say, to... feel free to communicate uh, at any point with us. Yes, Tim. Deb would like to say something. Could you unmute yourself, please, Deb? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I think, oh, and I, I just see the answer in the chat. I apologize. I think it's in the context of trying to take notes. I must have missed that. I thought I was reviewing and that we didn't discuss Wikidata yet, but I guess we did. Quentin says kind yes, of. and I was kind of looking at Elspeth's question, and I was like, hmm, did we really talk about that? Um, so I apologize. It. If that's got covered. Well, I, I think we covered it fairly uh, uh, lightly. Uh, we did talk about it in the previous um, call. Uh, and I think it'd be a good topic for a sort of breakout group from this group to talk about it in more depth. It okay. certainly should be one of the things that we produce a, a one page on or something like that. Uh, I think uh, the points made in the chat were, were good about, you know, some of the challenges or the scope. And Donald, you made that point that, you know, Wikidata may be very a very viable thing for certain groups and not as viable a method yeah. for others. But I think helping people understand that Wikidata is another option to increase visibility of their collections. And we know that already, that that's an incredibly valuable thing. So if they can be helped to, to do that, um, that's an added carrot if we can make it yeah. easy for them to do. And, uh, oh, uh, so yes, okay, thanks. Thanks, Carl, for for dealing, yes, you, if you can, you can use the alliance at gbif.org uh, email uh, to communicate uh, and Kyle and Annie will make sure that it gets distributed to all of us for handling. Uh, and that does include most definitely any offers for translations, which I assume is what um, uh, Marcella was uh, asking there. Uh, if anybody would like to uh, intervene with anything else at this point, please raise your hand. I meant the virtual hand, but go ahead, Deb. Oh, I just wanted to add as an aside, we have um, a, several groups meeting shortly to work on the standard. And we are yeah. working on um, the definition of the terms, et cetera, things like that. But I wanted to let the community, the broader community here know that in the standards development process, they may or may not be aware that what happens is as we develop this, we put it out for community comment. And this would be a great way in which to go back to this group, for example, and these people that are interested mm -hmm. clearly in this topic and make sure that they have an opportunity to review what we're doing. And it's open, the website is there and people can go and look if they're interested in this part um, of building a world uh, collections catalog. Yeah, thanks very much. And and in, I, I see that uh, Dipan Kars made this uh, this point a couple of times. And yes, yeah, certainly, uh, I think AI, machine learning, uh, applications of these technologies to assist us uh, will will certainly be of interest. Uh, compared to some areas of biodiversity informatics, uh, I. I see fewer immediately leaping out uh, to me than uh, than I do in some other areas, but I'm sure that there will be uh, uses which uh, could be could be valuable in this space. And so, yes, we would like to do that. Uh, no links to standards on the CD site. Can you put one up? Okay, thanks, Deb. Okay. Do you want to say something about accreditation and how the Tadwig standards work, Deb or Matt? Um, parsing the question in my brain. Standards being developed within the existing policy frameworks that drive documentation. I'm not sure policy. Vince, can you mm. weigh in on that? Matt? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about policy framework. I mean, they are being developed within the Tadwig standards development framework and process. Um, be interested to know what, what else you would be thinking about in terms of policy frameworks. Yeah, so keep typing, Mark. I think it, when I read that, I start thinking about, are you wondering if museums themselves agree on a policy for what we should be agreeing to be part of this group and contribute our information and 
I'm not sure where you're going. So that's why. Is it perhaps um, about IS, ISO and things like that? Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, for example, for accreditation, it's similar to. Oh, sorry. Uh, he's he's yeah, putting. Go, carry on. No, yeah, carry on. I'm just... Well, so so my my idea would be, you know, just like Index Herbariorum started out 75 years ago, and people were able to say, if you want to borrow from me, you also have to be lend to me. They they came up with an agreement of if we're going to play in the same sandbox, we have an agreement about being at this party together and calling ourselves uh, Index Herbariorum. And similarly to this, there could be some sort of agreement across collections that if we call ourselves a collection, we contribute to this as a policy. That seems like something synthesis people would know a lot about. That's why I sort of tagged events. Yeah, maybe if I could just quickly come in on this. I mean, I think the reality is it tends to happen more sort of the other way around. If we if we come up with something that um, is, you know, a really solid framework that we can start to embed in our technical systems, then eventually it becomes policy to use them and starts being involved in things like accreditation standards and so yeah. forth. So it's that kind of community take up is invariably where it starts. And then it starts to seep its way into, if you like, the officialdom of um, museums. So that's probably the way I would see this more likely happening at this stage. Yeah, um, so, and it's sorry, in, in a sense, sorry. Um, so I was just going to say, I see that Mark uh, mentioned um, Spectrum as an example of the accreditation that he's thinking about, um, which for those who don't know is um, something within the UK is, it's a set of core and kind of additional processes for collections management that um, many of the museums try and um, adhere to and uh, that collections management systems also try to build incompatibility with. So I think that's probably the route in for this. If we design this standard, it becomes part of um, a data standard and ultimately you'd expect and want this to start being built into our collections management system data structures. And at that point, that's probably where you'd see that hooking into things like spectrum processes. Yeah. I, th I think too that this, this entangles with the whole topic of incentives that, and, and with the sort of things that David Shorthouse was uh, mentioning about linkages to publishers the more we get to the stage where the number of valuable linkages and usages and uh, benefits back to researchers, curators, collection managers and others, uh, then the more it just gets reinforced uh, in the ways that have been described. Okay, incentives and carrots. Okay, I don't see any other hands up right now, and uh, it's nearly half past three in the morning on a Saturday here, uh, so I'm I'm ready to call it a day. Uh, we will we will summarize uh, summarize this and uh, provide some some feedback in the next few days. Uh, I also um, will work with the coordinators to make sure that if there are things that are missing from the ideas paper, uh, we get them embedded into it very soon. So um, thank you all. Um, I really appreciate the very active discussion here and um, I thank colleagues in Copenhagen uh, working from home for having uh, hosted this uh, on Zoom for us uh, and look forward to interacting with you all in the next couple of months. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Donald. Well done. No, thank you. Thanks. So when you let us know what the doodle poll says for our debrief on this. And uh, at the moment, at the moment uh, based on those who had already responded, there was one time that was clearly better than all the others. Because uh, when I last looked, everybody who'd responded picked that time, whereas there was debate about the others. Uh, 